many of you uh, may remember a few few weeks ago we started kind of a uh, a mini series of sorts and, and what we were doing in, in the course of that series we were working our way through uh, the days of, of what's called Passion Week and so we began with Palm Sunday Palm Sunday uh, we talked about how Jesus triumphantly rode into uh, Jerusalem he rode in on a donkey which declared that he was the Prince of Peace uh, we then moved on to Monday and Monday we talked about uh, Jesus and the cursing of the fig tree as well as the cleansing, the clearing of the temple. Uh, then we began talking about Tuesday. And so you know, last week was Tuesday, focusing on the discussion that Jesus had with the disciples towards the end of the day, in which he, his main message for them was that they needed to be ready, they needed to be prepared, and they needed to be engaged. And then Thursday night, for those of you that were here Thursday night, uh, we had the opportunity to, to watch and see an illustration of the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal that Jesus and his disciples took advantage of there in the upper room, and uh, which really laid the groundwork for Thursday. And I will say, if, if you were here, I know that you were blessed by it, of everybody that I heard. If you didn't, uh, I, it, it was a great evening, and it really did. It laid the groundwork for where we are today. What we know is that after... Uh, Jesus and the disciples had had uh, their last meal, had had the last supper. Uh, we know that, that Jesus spoke very clearly and very directly to the disciples during the course of that about what was going to be happening, what was coming up and really preparing them. Afterwards then, uh, they, they went out, they sang some hymns, they went out to uh, an olive grove, they went out to a garden. Uh, so Jesus walks into the olive garden. <laughs> so they and the disciples went into the garden. We know it as Gethsemane. They went into the olive garden. Jesus went away and prayed. Uh, we know that it was there in that garden that then Jesus was betrayed by Judas. Uh, we know that he was arrested. He was taken then to uh, the religious leaders where there was a, a, a sham of a trial uh, that they made accusations, uh, false accusations against him. We know that then early Friday morning they took him to, to go before Pilate. And, and the reason that they went before Pilate is that they wanted him to do their dirty work. Uh, they wanted Pilate to do what they could not do, which was to kill this Jesus, to crucify him. Uh, we know from reading the scriptures that, that Pilate did not want to be, even though he liked to rule with an iron fist, Paul, I mean, Pilate had no desire to be in the middle of a religious debate. And, and he did not want to fulfill what they were asking him to do, which was to crucify Jesus. And we know that because many times he tried to let him go. He tried in a lot of ways to let Jesus go. In fact, much of, if you really look at it, the beatings, the scourging that Jesus endured was an effort on Pilate's part to get the, the religious leaders and the Pharisees to say, okay, enough, you don't have to go that far. He was trying to find a way to do it without having to kill him. But, but everything that he did to him was not enough to satisfy the bloodlust of the religious leaders and, and the angry mob. Uh, and I will say this, you know, as you start talking about what Jesus endured, many people did not survive the scourgings and the beatings that he went through. Many times those were a death sentence in themselves. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but let me just say this. If you have a picture in your head of Jesus hanging on the cross with the crown of thorns perched nicely on his brow and a little bit of blood on his hands and a little bit on his feet and, and some kind of coming from his back as he looks upward towards the heavens to his Father, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I don't want to go into all the, I mean, all of the details, but what you need to understand is that uh, the Romans were very good at inflicting punishment. Uh, the beatings that Jesus endured would have left a horribly 
uh, disfigured and bloody Jesus. But even, you know, even the appearance of, of Jesus with, I mean, with his skin literally ripped off of his body in places by the whips, bloody, bruised, and beaten was not enough to satisfy the mob that still cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And so at that point, what, what Pilate did is we know that he, he actually, he symbolically, but he also, he washed his hands of the whole situation. Uh, he ceremonially washed his hands, which in essence was saying to the crowd, he said, listen, I know that you think I'm the one that is in charge here, but no. No, I'm not the one that is sentencing him to die. This is on you. I wash my hands of this situation, and it falls on you. At which point then, uh, probably a couple of the Roman soldiers would have placed a, a huge wooden crossbeam on Jesus' back. It's called the patabellum. And he would have been forced to carry that to, to the place that we know. It's called Golgotha. It's referred to as the cross. It's the place where he would be crucified. We call it Calvary. He would carry it there. Along the way, there were many that, that mocked him, that taunted him, that yelled at him, spit on him. When he got to, to Golgotha, they would then take the, the timber off of his back, they would place it on the upright, which was laid on the ground, then they would have laid Jesus on top of it. They probably would have tied ropes to his hands, and then with all of their strength, they would have stretched his arms out as far as they could until they could drive a nail through his right wrist. And they would pull and drive one through his left wrist. Then they lifted his feet and they placed them on the upright part of it. And they drove nails to his feet to secure them. You know, we listen to that and we think, ah. Oh. But as if that's not enough, then they would have taken the, the cross and they would have lifted it upright. And there was a hole probably two or three feet deep that it was designed to sit in. And as they lifted it up and it reached its apex it would have dropped into the bottom. And then they left Jesus to die. The next few hours, crowds gathered, mocked him, taunted him. In so many different ways. Two criminals that were hanging on opposite sides of him watched. One taunted him. The other was forgiven. But we come to Matthew 27. In Matthew 27, it says this, verse 45, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. Now, the sixth hour in Roman culture uh, would have been about noon. Okay, And so from noon until three, it tells us there was a darkness that came over all of the land. Now understand, this was nothing, it was supernatural. This was not a, this was not a sandstorm that blotted out the sun. This was not an eclipse uh, that happened in the middle of the day. This was, this was a supernatural event that no one standing on that hill had ever experienced before. It lasted for three hours. And, you know, what set that time apart, yes, was the darkness of the three hours, but there was something else that set that time apart from the rest of it. And that is because what's, what sets that time apart is that during those three hours, Jesus, the Son of God, the one and only Son of God, the Lamb of God, the only man who ever walked the earth that never, ever sinned, became the embodiment of sin. During that time, he carried your sins and my sins on his body. 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, Paul put it this way. said, God made him, meaning Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. During those three hours, Jesus carried the sin of the world on his body, past, present, and future. And you may ask why. You know, well, why? Why would that have to happen? It's because God is just. Because God is righteous. Because God is holy. And God must punish sin. In fact, God's, God's intolerance of sin, His hatred of sin, it's so great that in verse 46 we read, it says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And and here's the deal. Is that during that time, Jesus experienced two things that he never experienced before. Number one, he carried the sin of the world, your sins, my sins, on his body. But at the same time, for the first time since eternity passed, he experienced separation from his Father. And from eternity past, God the Father and God the Son have been in communion. They are one, but during this time, they were not. God could not look upon His Son. And, and you wonder why that's important. And, and people sometimes think, well, why did we put that in the Bible? It's just because Jesus said it. No, the reason that that is included in the Bible is because if Jesus, excuse me, if God could not stand to look upon His one and only Son, His one and only Son, because of the sin that he carried on his body. What makes you think that he's going to overlook, overlook your sin because you're a good person? Because you lived a good life? Because I try really hard? He won't. God does not grade on the curve. He does not make exceptions. He must punish sin. 3 p.m. John records in John 1930, Jesus said, It is finished. What was finished? Was he finished? What, what was finished? The work of redemption is what was finished. In, in fact, there was nothing more that needed to be done. As you read the Bible, you go back and, and what we find is under the Old Covenant, which you find in the Old Testament, the Jews, and, and they realized something that, that we didn't, that the wages of sin is death. And what that means is that when they sinned, something had to die. When, when they sinned, a sacrifice had to be offered. Okay? And so they, they recognized that. But here's the thing. No matter how many times they brought a, a dove or a pigeon or a lamb or a bull or a goat, no matter how many times that they brought it, and as a sacrifice for their sins, the fact is that there was nothing they ever brought that was truly perfect. And there was nothing they ever brought, even though it was in the prime of its life at that point, there is nothing that would never die on its own. It was all mortal. And it was all blemished in one way or another because it was the result of a fallen creation. But in Jesus, that was all different. Because for the first time, the only perfect sacrifice had been offered. And in the same way, if Jesus had made the decision that he did not want to die, he would not have died. No one took his life from him. No one took it. He willingly gave it. That's why at the time when, when he was coming uh, to the, the last things that he says, he says, it is finished. But that's a, that's a Greek word. And it's a Greek word that it's tetelastia. Okay? Now, the, the interesting thing is that in, in the Greek, Greek is a, it's a much better language <laughs> than ours. It, it, it is much clearer. Uh, it, there, when things get translated from Greek into English, so many times there's so much that gets lost in translation. We, we don't always get the whole word. Okay? And so, tetlastia, which, by the way, is the title of the sermon. And so, if you ever wanted to say, I can read Greek, then you can look in your bulletin at the title of the sermon and say, you can read tetlastia. It's right up there. Okay? Or you can write it. See, now you can learn how to write Greek. No? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> but it's a unique word. It, it doesn't... It's in what's called the perfect tense. Okay? And, and what the perfect tense means is that as you read that word, it doesn't just say it is finished. It really, a more accurate translation would be, it is finished, it stands finished, it will always be finished. It is finished. It stands finished. There's nothing else that needs to be done. It will always be 
finished. That, that is what that word means, which means that at one moment in time, the work of man's redemption and salvation was complete. Past, present, and yes, we know future as well. Then he called out, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He bowed his head and he breathed his last. Gave up his spirit. What we know is that then shortly uh, before sunset, some of the disciples came, Joseph of Arimathea came, and they took down the body of Jesus, and Joseph, he was given uh, possession of the body of Jesus, and he and Nicodemus took it, and uh, then they joined, they cleaned it up. They wrapped him in 75 pounds of spices. They put linen strips around him and 75 pounds of spices. You know, one of the things we always, we read that, we're like, well, ah, why was that? The spices are there to, to cover up the smell of a decaying body. They were burying him. And they were burying him in a tomb to stay in the tomb. That's what the disciples felt. They put him in the tomb, and then Joseph and, and Nicodemus rolled a stone in front of the entrance. That was to deter scavengers and grave robbers. And then they went home, numb. You know, for the next 30 hours or so, I, I really think that the, that the disciples and Jesus' followers just sat huddled in their homes behind locked doors wondering how in the world could God allow this to happen? How could it be? I mean, you think about it. 33 years earlier, Mary had given birth to a son. She had been told, she had been told that, that he would be Jesus, the Son of God, that his kingdom would last forever. But now he's dead. He's gone. And she's alone. Peter, James, John, the, the rest of the disciples, they had left everything to go follow him. And now, has it all been a waste? He's dead. He's gone. And, and you know, you know they had to wonder if, if the religious leaders are willing to do this to Jesus, to a man that the people loved. Was it, was it that hard to imagine that they would come and round up his disciples and get rid of them too? I think that Friday night inside, those were the darkest days that his disciples had ever, ever experienced. And up to this point, that's a depressing story, isn't it? Up to this point, there, there is no joy in this story. There's no, there's no hope in this story. Nothing. I mean, yes, we have forgiveness of our sins, but if it's just for this life, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 19 said, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But that's not the end of the story. That's not where it ends. The, the story of, of Jesus' passion, of His purpose, it Yes, it is an amazing story in and of itself, but, but if Jesus is in the tomb and that is where it ends, then He is nothing more than a martyr. But He didn't come to be a martyr. He came to be our Savior. And that's not the end of the story. Because early, early on Sunday morning then, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, some of the other women, they got together, they had gathered up spices, and they went to go and to pay their last respects to Jesus. They went to the tomb. And so as they are walking there, and I think they're talking about the things that had happened uh, the couple of days before, as they are walking there, suddenly the ground begins to shake and, and rumble. And then as quickly as it started, it ended. And so visibly shaken. <laughs> they all of a sudden, they, I think it you know, kind of knocks up. They're like, what are we going to do about the stone? They continue to make their way to where they had seen Joseph and Nicodemus place the body. As they get a little bit closer, they look and the stone's already been rolled away. You know, they run, they went in and they looked 
And they're like, oh, what, what has happened? They run into the tomb, and there they find it's empty. There is no Jesus. There is no body. There are just the burial cloths laying on a slab. And then suddenly, they are they're standing beside two men, and it says that their clothes gleamed like lightning. We know that they're angels. I, I think that it probably scared the women half to death. And they began to bow down. They bowed down to worship. And the angel stopped him with, with a question. He said, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why do you look for the living among the dead? And I, I think they stopped and they kind of look at each other. And, what does this mean? You know, is this a vision? Is this, what, what's he talking about? Look for the living among the dead. What, what's he talking about? At which point they said, he is not here. He has risen. <laughs> then they said, that, remember I told you? In Luke 24, 7, it says, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And I wonder if at that moment they said, He did say that, didn't He? See, and in that moment, in that moment, every, what had seemed like it was the end of everything they had ever hoped for, it became the hope of everything they had ever dreamed of. That moment, everything began to change. They turned around, they ran, they went and they told Peter and John. They, said, they began to tell them what they had seen. Peter and John didn't believe it, so they turned around and they ran. What did they find when they got there? The exact same thing. The tomb was empty. He was not there. All there were were, were linen cloths that were laying there, and he was gone. Was it a miracle? Had, had he been stolen? What had happened? Later on that day, two of the disciples would see him along the road to Emmaus. He would show up and begin talking to them. Answering all of their questions, they walk all of this way, probably over seven miles, that they walk with him, talking to him, and then suddenly he's gone, and it says that, that then all of a sudden he opened their eyes and they realized, holy cow, it was him. And they ran all the way back to tell the other disciples. We know that Jesus did. He, he showed up. He appeared to Peter. We know that he appeared then to the disciples. They're in a locked room, huddled for safety, and all of a sudden, Jesus is there with them. Can, can you imagine the joy? I, I have said it time and time again. I think that one of the reasons that we don't truly, I, are not just overwhelmed by, by Resurrection Sunday is because we have never learned how to live. We've never experienced living through Good Friday, Black Friday, and, and Saturday in between. We know how the story ends, don't we? We know. Hey, he was crucified, but Sunday's coming. I mean, we got to, I know, Tammy loves the song. She always sings it, in, and it is a great sentiment. But I think that sometimes we lose sight of the absolute overwhelming joy of the resurrection because we know how the story ends. We, we don't realize what it must have felt like for them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Mary Magdalene when she turns and she says, she sees this man and she says, but tell me where you have taken my Lord. Tell me, tell me. And he says her name and he says, Mary. And all of a sudden she's like, it's you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine as Peter is standing there? We, we listened this morning. We listened this morning to, to Don Francisco's He's Alive. And Joshua was sitting there in the car as we're driving along. And, you know, it talks all about of how Peter is just so forlorn. He's full of shame. He's full of guilt. He feels like he's failed Jesus. And suddenly, Jesus is there. Woo! I think we miss that. I don't think we embrace that. Because it was that moment that drove those men and drove those women to take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world to endure everything that they did. Why? Because He's alive. Why? Because He is risen. Why? Because He's not here. Just like He said. He's alive. Oh, man. That's why I get so excited. I, it's not because I'm the preacher. I've been this way for years. I just... I'm serious. 
I, I love I love Resurrection Sunday because of what it represents. I think that in so many ways, we, I know we did this, and it's funny how God works things out. You know, my, my plan was that I was going to do this series I mean, every day, you know, we, or each Sunday, excuse me, we were going to take one of the days of Passion Week and talk about it. And that was, that was originally my goal, which means that, you know, last Sunday we would have been talking about the crucifixion and this Sunday we would have been talking about the resurrection. And, you know, as it ended up working, I started looking at the schedule, it wasn't going to work. And I'm so glad it didn't. Because I think we need to keep the crucifixion and the resurrection tied so closely together. They go hand in hand. Without... Without one, the other really doesn't have any meaning. Think about it. If Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that's great that our sins are forgiven. But if it is only for this life, then then it's. I mean, if he's not raised from the dead, then that's just a rental fee. It's just temporary. I mean, if our hope is only for this life, then we are we're a miserable lot. We are wasting a lot of time in here. And see, and, and if it's not for the fact that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world is not for the fact that He accepted your punishment and, and my punishment for our <laughs> sins, then, then the resurrection of Christ is nothing more than, than something for show. It's just something for us to go, wow, that was really cool. But see, when the two of them are together, when the two of them are, are combined together and go hand in hand, we are reminded of the fact that that our sins are forgiven, that the debt has been paid, that, that Jesus paid a price that we could never pay, that He accepted a punishment that we could never endure. We know that, that because of the cross that we stand righteous before God, that for those who believe in the gospel, on the cross, we talked about this, we went through Romans, that, that there there is a righteousness is revealed in the gospel, a righteousness that is by faith, that we are saved by grace through Faith. Not because of what we do, not because we no, not because we're amazing people, not because we keep all the commandments, not because we live a good life, not because we give a lot of money to charity, not because we go out and we do all kinds of things. No, we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Because he paid our debt on the cross. That is how we are saved. And that goes hand in hand then with the fact that on the third day he was raised again, which means that we know we are not forgiven of our sins just for this life. This life is not all that there is. We know that because death could not hold him, it cannot hold us either. Because he was resurrected, we too will be resurrected. We know that. We know that that we have, as the song said, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, and I'm forgiven heaven's gates are open wide. We know that it is finished. That it stands finished. And it will always be finished. Because of the resurrection, we know that Jesus, God has given His stamp of approval upon everything that Jesus did and said during His ministry. As we, as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. I want to I kind of leave you with something because the fact is that whether you are a Christian or not, the resurrection has, has great implications for you. If you are a believer, the resurrection tells us that, that eternity is coming. The resurrection tells us that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. The, the, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ tells us that there is nothing that He will not endure for the glory of God to provide salvation for us. It, it tells us that, that there is nothing that the world can throw at us that He has not already overcome. End of story. The resurrection is, is Jesus telling us I'm with you always and forever. And there is nothing that you cannot do through my strength, through me who gives you strength. We can do this. 
For those of you that may not be Christians, the crucifixion and the resurrection tell you the gospel. That God loves you so much that He gave His one and only Son. They sent Him to earth to die on the cross to pay your debt, to pay your penalty, to accept your punishment so that you didn't have to. And that if you will only believe in Him, doesn't mean you have to know all the answers. That is the equivalent of saying all of the answers. We don't have to have it all figured out. What we've got to say is, God, you sent your son. You sent your son to die for me. I believe. I believe that he came. I believe that he died. I believe that through him my sins are forgiven. And I believe that on the third day he was raised. And that's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. And I will rest in that. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to have a time of decision. And for those of you that may be busy, you may not know how we do things here. And so I just want to tell you how we're going to do things here. We have got two rooms that are going to be open, and we have prayer teams in those rooms. If you are here today, and whether it is through one of the songs, whether it is through something that was that was said through the message, maybe it was something that you read, maybe it's something that God's just been working on your heart, and you want somebody to pray with you, you want somebody to pray for you, that is what those rooms are for. They have one of our elders, one of their wives are in them. You just need to step in there, and they will pray with you and pray for you. You don't have to say a thing. Maybe you have a decision to make. Maybe you want to give your life to Christ. Maybe you want to surrender a part of your life to Christ. They would love to share that moment with you as well. Whether you are a Christian today or not, the resurrection holds great implications for you. Because the fact is that we believe, as the Bible teaches, that everybody spends eternity somewhere. And Jesus Christ stepped down out of heaven, took on human form, died on the cross to forgive your sins so that you could spend eternity in heaven with your heavenly Father. If you have a decision to make, I invite you to make it now.